Hello everyone, it's been quite a while, eh? Uh, an opportunity presented itself in one of the classes I'm taking for my master's degree. Um, and I decided to seize it, upload a new video uh, to this channel, even though it's been, I think, like well over a year. I hope you're all doing well, and that time has been treating you kindly. Uh, I hope you all had a excellent Thanksgiving this past Thursday at the time of recording. But uh, without further delay, let's get right to the topic of this very special video. So, as you probably saw when you looked at the thumbnail for this video, the topic for today is Lemuel Haynes. Now, who was Lemuel Haynes? He was a fairly significant figure in the history of the United States, but he's overlooked, sadly overlooked in my opinion, by most history class uh, textbooks and curricula. Textbooks don't mention him, and shows on American history usually only make passing reference to him. You know, shows like America, The Story of Us, stuff like that, they don't really mention him very much. Uh, so I felt that I wanted to bring this story to you to give him the credit he deserves, and hopefully to encourage you to dig a little bit deeper uh, into this figure and maybe other figures from American history that have been left out of what we're studying in class. Who knows? Maybe covering a topic like this will, I don't know, broaden your horizons and get you a little more interested in history. Maybe you want to go do some of your own research and find out who else is being left out. Lemuel Haynes was born on July 18th, 1753 in West Hartford, Connecticut. Unfortunately, his parentage is not that well known. Uh, we do know that his father was an African-American man. Uh, we don't know much beyond that. Many historians believe that he was likely a slave or an indentured servant just because of the uh, job prospects at the time and the fact that this was most likely how he would have met uh, Lemuel's mother. Um, Lemuel's mother, however, is also like shrouded in mystery. So there, there's a few different theories about who she might be. Um, but there's, there's two possible candidates that most historians put forward. That's either Lucy Fitch or Alice Fitch, uh, sisters who worked for the Haynes family, John Haynes, of West Hartford, Connecticut. Um, that isn't where the intrigue ends, though. There is another theory that one of these two women was actually a stand-in or a surrogate who chose to take the blame of having a child without being married, a major taboo at the time, for a woman belonging to a, a wealthier, upper-class family. Now, to be clear, this isn't a surrogate the way we use it today, where a, a pregnancy is transplanted into a different woman and then she carries that baby to term. In this case, it would be um, the pregnant woman, the wealthier woman, and either Lucy or Alice go away for a time and then return with a baby and Lucy or Alice say it's my baby while the wealthier woman who just had a child out of wedlock doesn't face any of the consequences of that. Uh, either way, Lemuel was not with his mother for very long as he was abandoned and given into indentured servitude to Deacon David Rose and his wife Elizabeth. Despite technically being their indentured servant, uh, which at the time was barely a step up above slave, uh, they raised him as if he were their own child. Apparently, Haynes and some others that knew the family liked to joke that Elizabeth treated him better than she treated her own kids. Uh, Deacon Rose, whose eyesight was failing, he was practically blind, had young Lemuel work alongside him on their farm. He also attended a racially segregated church at night, having to sit apart from the Rose family, because of his African ancestry. So even though he was being raised by the Rose family as basically their child, he had to sit apart from them because of the segregation of the church that they attended. Nevertheless, Haynes quickly grew an interest in Christian theology. This interest led to him reading the Bible and the writings of many Calvinist theologians, sometimes even writing his own sermons and sharing them with the Roses and even with his church, which is surprising considering it's a segregated church and they allowed him to speak anyway. Uh, their enthusiastic response and support of his sermons would serve as the foundation of his later course in life. <music> Lemuel Haynes was born on July 18th, 1753 
Lemuel wasn't an indentured servant forever. At the age of 21, his time as an indentured servant came to an end. Faced with the ability to make choices for himself, Haynes immediately joined the local militia, the Minutemen of Granville, Massachusetts. His time serving <clears throat> in a military capacity wasn't long, lasting only from 1774 to 76, but he did serve a role in defending the newly captured Fort Ticonderoga that the rebels had just captured from the British um, months prior. In these two years stationed in the fort, Haynes was further exposed to ideas beyond what he had already learned in his hometown. Uh, ideas about freedom and Republican politics. That's Republican with a small R, not a uh, capital R. Capital R Republican is the Republican Party, which wouldn't exist for another eight or so decades. Uh, in this case, Republican meaning Republican government, like representative government with democratic values. Uh, these meshed with, the, with his religious ideas uh, he was exposed to in his youth and his own personal experiences. And he began to form his own ideas of how freedom in America didn't quite mean the same thing to him that it did to his fellow militiamen. In 1776, Haynes was dismissed from his service with the Minutemen after coming down with a case of typhus. Uh, having nowhere else to go, he returned to the Rose House and his adoptive family of sorts to heal from his infection. Uh, to be clear, he viewed this as his home, even though he was, again, an indentured servant there. When he had, when, when he was dismissed, he went back to the Rose House. He didn't um, wander around or... or or try and find his own place because he didn't have a, a spot to go to. No, he felt like that was his home. While back at home, he wrote a response to the Declaration of Independence called Liberty Further Extended, where he explained his views on American independence and clearly stated that America's quest for freedom would never truly end as long as slavery existed in the country. Uh, though it wasn't published during his lifetime, it was widely circulated later uh, by abolitionists, mostly during the lead up to and during the Civil War era. You can find it today in all sorts of formats. After recovering from typhus and considering what he wanted to do now, Haynes began studying with clergy in Massachusetts and Connecticut. In 1780, Haynes' studies were rewarded with a license to preach given to him by Reverend Daniel Ferrand. With this, he served his town parish in Middle Granville. He was eventually fully ordained as a pastor in 1785, becoming the first black member of the clergy in the history of the Christian, Christian church in the United States of America. Now, that means he was the first black priest or pastor or whatever your denomination calls them in the entirety of Christianity in the United, United States. He went on to serve at Hemlock Congregational Church in Torrington, Connecticut for three years before moving to West Parish Church of Rutland, Vermont for 30 years. During this time, Haynes was writing all sorts of pamphlets, books, and essays on what is truly meant, what it truly meant to be free, and the violations of slavery from an American political approach and from a Christian theological approach. Theological means uh, religiously based or based in... Um, the ideology of Christianity. This made him uncommon among abolitionists at the time, who mostly focused on one or the other, but Haynes' ability to meld American political ideals with scripture made him that much more effective in the eyes and ears of his viewers and listeners. However, it wasn't all sunshine and rainbows for our friend Lemuel, as his fiery support for the ending of slavery in his sermons and public writings would rub church officials the wrong way. Unfortunately, he was dismissed from his position in 1818 by the Rutland Church Council. Historians debate whether it was racially or politically motivated, but most agree it was at least one of the two, if not both. Personally, I think it was probably both. He was using the pulpit to espouse his personal views, and while I agree with them, it's understandable that some might be like, you know, save that for your own personal time, don't do it at church. I still think it was wrong. I think he should have been allowed to, to continue to serve, but, you know, that's all history now. This didn't stop Haynes, though, as he got yet another preaching position, this time in, at South Granville Congregational Church in South Granville, New York, where he would serve as pastor until his death in 1833. So it's not all bad. He did get a job almost immediately after and not that far away from where he was.
The impact of a figure like Haynes on American history is difficult to overstate. He was one of the leading early figures in the fight against slavery, and his support for the ending of the slave trade and the institution of slavery itself contributed to laws that encouraged the freeing of slaves and the abolition of slavery in the northern states. Uh, the way Haynes formulated his arguments against slavery drew upon two powerful sources in early American history, the Holy Bible and the words of the Founding Fathers. Even Frederick Douglass, uh, perhaps one of the most influential abolitionists of all time, uh, would use a similar tactic that Haynes used with liberty further extended by pointing to, the de pointing to the Declaration of Independence and its words, all men are created equal and endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights as a direct condemnation of the slave trade and its unequal treatment and deprivation of an entire population of those very rights. Without Lemuel Haynes and others like him leading the abolitionist cause and laying the foundation with their arguments early on, I have no doubt that later freedom seekers would have had a much more difficult time. And without people like Haynes, perhaps the abolitionist movement would have been delayed by decades, and that would have been to our detriment. And there we are, everybody. I hope you've enjoyed this very special episode, and perhaps my final one. When I started this channel, it was to just bide time during the initial COVID uh, lockdown situations. Now that those have been lifted and I've returned back to the classroom, I don't have as much time to record anymore, and I, I don't really find myself with the energy to do it. So this might be my last one up here. I trust you've learned a little something about a lesser known figure in our history, at, at the very least. If you want to learn more, I've found some sources that delve a bit deeper into different aspects of Mr. Haynes's life. You can find them linked in the description below. Now, perhaps the final time, let's take a look at the question of the day. Today's question is, do you think the Declaration of Independence should have made it clear that all men included those that were currently enslaved within the nation. What impact do you think that might have had? Be sure to leave your answers in the comments below and let's get this discussion rolling. I look forward to reading what you, ha you all have to say on this. That's all I have for you. Please remember to keep your comments clean and civil. And as always, have a great rest of your day, you lovely, lovely people. Bye.